Right, let's go to the second unit of this module, the principles of learning and teaching. Let's look at some of the general principles that most teachers, practitioners adhere to when they are teaching and when they think about how their students learn. The basic principles that underlie effective learning, some of the following principles are these. One, students' prior knowledge can help or hinder learning. Right, So you don't teach to a student who has no background information or no knowledge at all. We don't think that a student comes to us with an empty slate. They come to us with some experiences or a lot of experiences. Yeah? Students come into our courses with knowledge, their beliefs and their respective attitudes. So these knowledge, beliefs and attitude influences how they filter and interpret what they are learning. All right? They influence greatly how they perceive our teaching. And this knowledge also provides a foundation for building new knowledge. Right? It's sort of the new knowledge is built upon this knowledge. This new knowledge, or which is built upon all the, this foundation, you know, this, this past knowledge or their prior knowledge can interfere with or impede new learning. Not everything that we teach automatically becomes part of their, the, the learning that they already have, the, the knowledge that they already have. It can be a hindrance. It can be an obstacle. Number two, how students organize knowledge influences how they learn and apply what they know. Right? Because different students apply, um, organize their knowledge differently. You know, some are very visual, some are very tactile, some need to put their information in a very linear manner. So how do students make connections between pieces of knowledge? Right? Different students have different ways of doing it. So when knowledge structures are accurately and meaningfully organized, students are better able to retrieve and apply their knowledge effectively and efficiently. Right? So they need to organize the knowledge that they are receiving onto their prior knowledge in a very systematic manner. Only then can learning take place. Now, if it's done in a very haphazard manner, if the students don't have the ability to connect this new knowledge with the prior knowledge, then there is um, a, learning does not take place. Right? Students' motivation determines, directs and sustains what they do to learn. So students may need a greater autonomy over what, when and how they study and, and learn because this influences the quality of learning. If you force a student to learn something, of course, he's not going to be, that, that learning is not going to be a very effective learning. So many a times, in many cases, students do not have the choice. Right? In primary school, in secondary school, students do not have the choice of what they want to learn. The syllabus is already prepared. So how do we go about making them want to learn what they want to learn? So motivation plays a critical role in guiding the direction, intensity, persistence and quality of the learning behaviours. How well they learn, how much they retain, how motivated they are to pursue that education all depends yeah motivation number four to develop mastery students must acquire component skills practice integrating these skills and know when to apply these skills that they have learned right so students must develop not only the component skills and knowledge necessary to perform complex task, right? They not only need to learn the skills that is important to, to perform complex tasks, like, you know, we want to teach them reading, so we teach them the different skills, skimming, scanning, looking at contextual clues and all that, right? We teach all these skimming, scanning and context, looking at contextual clues 
may be in isolation. We teach them in isolation. But the students must be able to practice combining and integrating all these skills so that reading becomes a more efficient, effective process. They must also learn when and how to apply the skills and knowledge that they learn, right? For example, I teach you skimming, I teach you scanning, and I teach you contextual clues. How to look at the sentences and look at the information given in the paragraph to guess a word or to guess what's, guess the meaning of the word or guess what's going on, right? Now, students must, be, must know when do I use this particular skill and when do I use that particular skill, right? Instructors or facilitators must develop conscious awareness of these elements of mastery so as to help our students learn more effectively. So when we are teaching a particular subject, a particular course, we must be able, to, the facilitators, the teachers must be able to look at these skills in isolation and also be able to provide learners with the skills to combine these skills so that you know learning takes place number five goal directed practice coupled with targeted feedback enhances the quality of students learning right the key word here is feedback engage in practice that focuses on a specific goal or criterion targets an appropriate level of challenge and is of sufficient quantity and frequency to meet the performance criteria Right? So students must engage in practice. It must not be so easy that it becomes boring. It must not be so difficult that they give up. Right? So it must be at a level that they find it challenging, but they can still do it. Practice must be coupled with feedback that explicitly communicates about some aspect, aspects of students' performance relative to specific target criteria. So. Um, students need feedback. It can be an oral feedback, it can be in writing, you know, grades, little phrases after the exercises or sitting down with the student and discussing their particular work with them is all feedback. Uh, provides information to help students progress in meeting those criteria and is given at a time and frequency that allows it to be useful. So feedback is not just given at any time that you want to give. All right. So that feedback must be given progressively so that the students can act according to the feedback and based on the feedback, they do make pros, uh, progress in their learning. Number six, students' current level of development interacts with the social, emotional, and intellectual climate of the course to impact learning. Students are not only intellectual, but also social and emotional beings. And they are still developing the full range of intellectual, social, and emotional skills. Yeah? We cannot teach a student and look at him with Oh, okay, I just want him to remember this, memorize this, um, you know, look at him as in isolation, irrespect, um, devoid of his social and emotional skills. So students come in with their social skills and with their emotional skills. So therefore, we need to take into this into account when we are teaching. While we cannot control the developmental process, we can shape the intellectual, social, emotional, and physical aspects of classroom climate in developmentally appropriate ways, right? One of the things you may want to read about is Suggestopedia, all right? Because Suggestopedia is one of those um, um, methods or approaches that looks into these, um, the classroom climate when we want to teach. So look up, yeah? Go to Google and look up Suggestopedia. Uh, S-U-G-G-E-S-T-O-P-A-E-D-I-A -E -E You know, you go to Google, type this up and read that up. It gives you quite a lot of information about classroom climate. In fact, many studies have shown that the climate we create has implications for our students, you know, teachers, whether we have a very strict, disciplined classroom. No noise, everybody do your work, no discussing. Put out, take out your textbooks, open to page so and so, or we form them into groups. You know, sit down and discuss. 
are there activities so this kind of climate that we create in a classroom can make can influence a child's learning a negative climate may impede learning and performance but a positive climate can energize students learning to become self directed learners students must learn to monitor and adjust their approaches to learning right so the word metacognitive comes into this what is metacognitive basically metacognitive is when we all right or a learner a learner sits down and reflects on how he or she learns what do i do to make my learning more effective if i don't understand something do i go and approach a friend a classmate or my teacher or my uh, uh, parents or a significant other to make them explain to me or am i one of those people who always just goes in and into the media and looks up everything online to help me understand or do i look up dictionaries to find the meaning of words instead of going for contextual clues so this process of thinking of reflecting how do i learn what are the things that i do to make my learning effective uh, that is metacognitive process so assessing the task at hand evaluating their own strengths and weaknesses planning their approach applying and monitoring various strategies and reflecting on the degree to which their current approach is working all this yeah metacognitive processes students tend not to engage in these processes naturally so a lot of students do not engage in metacognitive process naturally they need to be taught and some of this process like you know uh, approaching a significant other having a discussions going online forums to discuss so that you understand better l- uh, effective learning takes place going online to understand better all these processes does not come naturally they need to be taught develop the skills to engage these processes they gain intellectual habits they not only improve their performance but also the effectiveness as learners so when they develop these skills it helps them improve their performance their learning performance the whole cycle of learning and they are also their effectiveness as learners they become effective learners